Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtually speaking series. I'd particularly like to welcome my current students who've made the wise decision to join us, and we'll do a lot better in the test tomorrow than other students who haven't. Tonight, we're joined by Britain's best known legal commentator, Joshua Rosenberg, to discuss his latest book, Enemies of the People, How Judges Shape Society. I'm delighted to have been asked to host this evening. My name's Paul Goldsmith. I teach politics, economics, and geography as well as being head of year 10 at Latimer Upper School. I also wrote a book on why the Brexit vote happened, and I'm currently studying for a PhD on the legislation that set up that very referendum. I'm looking forward to spending the next hour talking with Joshua about his book and his thoughts on the role of the judiciary in our political system. Having been a student at Latimer, Joshua qualified as a solicitor after attending Oxford. He's the only legal journalist to have been appointed Queen's Counsel Honoris Causa. He's written for the Law Society Gazette, newspapers, and appears regularly on Sky News and BBC news outlets. Joshua is the BBC's legal correspondent for 15 years and returned in 2010 to present the popular Radio 4 series, Law in Action. In 2012, he was the only journalist to be included in the Times list of the UK's 100 most influential lawyers. Joshua is well respected for his independence and ability to explain complex legal issues with simplicity and wit. I first came across the name Joshua Rosenberg during an abortive attempt to work in professional public relations 20 years ago. My boss sat me down to talk through the journalists we communicate with and how to write a press release. He ended by saying, all our press releases need to be of such high quality that even Joshua Rosenberg might use them. I also subscribed to his excellent newsletter, which you can subscribe to, uh, A Lawyer Writes, at www.rosenbergnet, which means that given I'm also signed up to his formidable wife, Melanie Phillips' daily newsletter, I'm currently receiving daily correspondence from two members of what must be one of the most interesting family dinner tables in existence. Just before we start conversations with Joshua, I wanted very briefly to tell you a little bit about the Virtually Speaking series. We launched this program of online talks over the summer as a way of bringing the Latimer community together in the absence of our usual social events. And of course, these events are also fundraisers for our bursary appeals. And this means a lot to me for a number of reasons. Chiefly, in 1950, a boy brought up in poverty in the East End applied for and was granted a bursary to Merchant Taylor School near Watford in Hertfordshire. That one bursary meant that my father's children and grandchildren have been given the best educational opportunities available. One bursary doesn't sif simply lift one lucky Charlie bucket, it can change the life chances of generations. And finally, a couple of house rules for this evening's talk. Everyone will be on mute so that you can hear the presentation clearly. Do feel, please feel free to type questions in the chat facility and I'll ask Joshua as many as time allows at the end. And so it just remains for me to welcome Joshua Rosenberg and to ask my first question. Joshua, why was your book called Enemies of the People? Enemies of the People was a famous headline on the Daily Mail after what we refer to as the first Miller case. Gina Miller challenged uh, the uh, legislation or lack of legislation about Brexit. You remember that uh, uh, to trigger Brexit, the government had to follow Article 50, uh, I know you're writing this PhD about it, you know it much better than I do. And the question uh, was whether the government could use its inherent powers, its prerogative powers, the powers which were derived from centuries back to trigger Brexit, or whether it required legislation. The government thought it could actually uh, go ahead without the need for legislation. Um, and uh, that was challenged by Gina Miller, who was, if you like, a figurehead, and uh, a number of people supported her. Um, and when the Divisional Court, uh, which is another name for the High Court, three judges, uh, decided that legislation was needed, uh, some newspapers took the view that this was blocking Brexit, this was making it more difficult for the government to trigger Brexit, uh, and that this was interfering uh, with the result of the referendum, which of course was in favour of Brexit. And that is why the Daily Mail famously headlined a picture of the three judges who had decided that legislation was needed with this question, with this statement, with this allegation, this headline, enemies of the people, I have put a question mark after it in my uh, book because I obviously don't necessarily accept that it is um, true and you have to read the book to find out whether I agree with the Daily Mail's view of the judges. So one of the things about your book that I particularly enjoyed was the discussion at the beginning of our political system. 
And uh, in particular, I just want you to, if you can, explain our judiciary's place in the political system. As you know, the United Kingdom is one of very few countries whose constitution isn't written down in a single place. We have an uncodified constitution. So too does Israel, one or two other places, New Zealand. Um, and so uh, the various parts of the constitution have to be found in different ways. Um, we have a system known as the common law, whereby judges lay down law because once a judge has decided something and other judges follow it, then if everybody's going to follow it, uh, that is the law. That is the common law, it's judge-made law. But we also have parliament, of course, and parliament can pass legislation and the legislation can override judge-made law. And so what you have is, is a system uh, whereby you have different parts of the constitution in balance. You have the legislature, uh, which tends to be dominated by the party that has won the election, although not always. Uh, normally that party can get its legislation through, although in 2019 it, it found it very difficult to do that. You have um, judges who are the only people who can interpret the legislation laid down by parliament. But if parliament doesn't like the judge's interpretation, they can rewrite the legislation. But of course, who has to interpret the legislation? Well, it's the judges again. So normally you have these three elements of the constitution in balance. From time to time, it gets unbalanced. And that's when it gets really interesting. Uh, do you, to what extent do you think people actually understand how laws are made and how we're governed? I don't think they do. I don't think they really understand why judges have to develop the law. I don't, some people think, well, surely Parliament lays down the law and the judges must simply observe it. Um, it's quite interesting. The, um, when when um, uh, the United States has um, people elected to its Supreme Court, it uh, goes in for having them uh, appearing before the Senate and they have uh, confirmation hearings. And when John Roberts was nominated by President George W. Bush as Chief Justice of the United States in 2005, he was determined not to repeat mistakes made by a predecessor, Robert Bork, who was thrown out by the Senate. Uh, and he uh, avoided, this is Roberts, avoided taking clear positions. And uh, what he said was this, he said, judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. I'm quoting that from the book because it's on the first page and that's the only page I can remember. And, and the point about uh, that is it's completely wrong. Of course the judges make the rules. Of course judges are not umpires. It's not possible for legislation to cover all possible uh, uh, instances of, 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 of the law, anything that might possibly happen. You so always need judges to interpret the law and if other judges are going to follow their interpretations, that's how you build up the common law. And are you comfortable with the place and the power of the judiciary in the UK at the moment? On the whole, I am, yes. Uh, and the judges themselves take some comfort from the fact that they can be overturned by Parliament. Equally, they're well aware that when you get to very difficult social and moral issues, sometimes it's too difficult for Parliament to act. Uh, and, and sometimes you might even think, and this is your PhD, not mine, you might think that when the judges were looking at Brexit, they thought, well, maybe we should just give Parliament a chance to look at this once more and see if MPs really do support what the government's doing. Because, of course, we know that the people who were in Parliament uh, at the time of the referendum in 2016 were not, on the whole, in favour of Brexit. And so, I, I, sorry, go on. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll come, I'll come to Brexit in a minute, but uh, I was interested in a quote you gave from Lord Bingham that the democratic mm. process is liable to be subverted if on a question of moral and political judgment, opponents of the act achieve through the courts what they could not achieve in government. That happens a lot, doesn't it? Well, it's certainly something that people try. And the very fact that Bingham said in that case that he wasn't going to go there, I think this was about hunting, wasn't it? Yes. Um, um, this was the, the attempt to overturn the Hunting Act, hunting with dogs. Um, and, and, the, and, and campaigners were using the courts to try to get around uh, the decision that Parliament had taken. They were trying to restore hunting. Um, and um, Bingham wasn't having anything of that. Uh, and I think the judges are sensitive to their role. They have to decide how far to go. Sometimes they go 
a long way down this road. And they say that legislation passed by parliament doesn't mean what parliament intended it to mean. It isn't clear enough, it isn't straightforward enough, it certainly can't exclude their jurisdiction. Sometimes they say, we're simply not going to decide cases like this, we're going to leave it to parliament. Critics then say, well, parliament will never get round to it. And there are one or two cases in my book when parliament has actually introduced legislation very, very quickly, like on divorce, for example, no fault divorce. So um, you can't really be sure but the judges have to take a very, have to tread a very careful path between not upsetting the public and the public's view of what judges should do, and yet making sure that justice is done. They do tread a careful path, and I, and I imagine they were trying to do that with their judgment around the prorogation. So the prorogation, the suspension of Parliament 2019, I found myself rather terrified by that, because our unwritten constitution, as you argue, relies upon those in charge doing the decent thing. And who judges what the decent thing is? In this case, the Supreme Court decided that what Boris Johnson had done was not the decent thing. And it's a classic example, isn't it? I mean, how come uh, five weeks prorogation is indecent by my definition and by the Supreme Court's definition, but one or two weeks is perfectly okay? And how come the High Court, presided over by the present Lord Chief Justice, thought that this was something that the judges couldn't get involved in and the supreme court overturned them not only unanimously but without even mentioning their reasoning in the supreme court's judgment which was seen as very rude to um, the uh, the members of the supreme court uh, to the members of the high court um, so it is a question of judgment what does this feel like and it felt to the supreme court as if the prime minister was trying to thwart parliament block Parliament, prevent Parliament from sitting at what was then seen to be a crucial moment in the nation's history. And that is why the Supreme Court intervened. It might not have happened, wouldn't have happened if the High Court judges had been sitting in the Supreme Court, perhaps. Uh, certainly that was their decision. Um, but it's very much a question of what feels right uh, and, and, and what, what it's a question of judgment. And if judges haven't got judgment, they shouldn't be judges. Um, quite a lot changed in 1998 with the introduction of the Human Rights Act. Can you explain the importance of that piece of legislation? I think that people didn't quite understand how important this was. Um, this was Tony Blair's government. He became Prime Minister in 1997. And he and his Lord Chancellor, Lord Irvin of Legg, hit the ground running with a piece of legislation that they had prepared uh, and which they uh, introduced and which in the excitement, and it certainly was excitement, of a change of government um, after a long period of conservative government, nobody really paid much attention to. It was very, very subtly drafted and quite difficult to understand. It was actually a great tribute to Lord Irvin, uh, and he deserves credit for it because it balances the rights of Parliament and the rights of the judges. It does not allow the Supreme Court or any court to declare legislation unconstitutional. That is the great difference between the United Kingdom and the United States. The US courts uh, can declare uh, legislation unconstitutional and overturn it. Uh, Irvin and Parliament following his drafting decided that it couldn't, but it can declare legislation incompatible with human rights. And that gives a nudge to Parliament to put things right. Or even more dramatically, and this was again, not really grasped I think at the time, it can, as the lawyers say, read down legislation, it can reinterpret legislation, it can almost rewrite legislation, indeed it has to rewrite legislation in order to comply with the Human Rights Convention. And that's quite a dramatic power, and one which the government at the moment is quite uncomfortable about. So we can probably start now, you've explained declarations of incompatibility and reading down by looking at some of the more interesting cases you talk about in your book. And let's start with Godin Mendoza. Uh, which is uh, to do with property, I think. Exactly so. Um, this was a flat in Earl's Court, um, and um, a chap lived there, um, and he had a protected tenancy. This is years ago, and this meant he paid quite low rent, um, and he died. Um, and if he had been a married man, then his widow would have been able to inherit this low rent tenancy, which is a very valuable thing, you know, living in a uh, flat in Earl's Court, even in a basement um, near the tube, very handy, uh, worth a lot of money, and he wasn't paying very much rent. The landlord wanted to get him out. Um, as I say, if he had been married, um, then 
uh, his widow could have inherited it. If he had been uh, living with a woman as his wife, cohabiting, then even in those circumstances, she could have inherited the tenancy if they'd been living together as man and wife. Uh, but the person that he was living with uh, was another man. Uh, he was uh, in a gay relationship. And the question for the Supreme Court, this was shortly after the Human Rights Act came into effect, must have been the House of Lords, um, in the early 2000s, um, was whether his partner could inherit the tenancy in the same way as a female partner could. And they looked at the Human Rights Act, looked at the legislation, uh, and decided that his male partner could uh, inherit the tenancy and uh, carry on living there at a low rent. Uh, and they, they were simply applying new facts and reading the law, which didn't say anything about male partners, to the circumstances of human rights. And, and, and actually linked with this is the uh, case to do with gays being allowed to be in the army, which I believe judges declared legislation irrational. Uh, and I might have got that slightly wrong. So no, how can right. judges do that? Well, before we got to the Human Rights Act, um, the judges developed what's called judicial review. Judicial review is a way of looking at powers given to often a minister, it might be a local authority, somebody who is given delegated powers by parliament in order to take decisions, and looking at the way in which that decision maker took those decisions, and deciding whether the decision maker had acted lawfully or not. Now, this is all common law. This is all judge-made law. It's never been codified. Indeed, there's a review going on at the moment to see whether it should be. And one of the doctrines that the courts developed is whether the decision maker acted irrationally. In other words, whether they, the decision maker acted unreasonably. And there are all sorts of cases and all sorts of uh, principles that the judges developed in order to make sure that decisions were taken properly. Now, the judges insist that they don't look at the decision itself, they don't decide whether the airport should be built, they simply look at whether the planning inspector has obeyed the rules. Uh, they don't decide uh, who should get a particular, um, uh, whatever it is that the minister is giving out or the local authority is giving out, they simply decide whether the minister has considered all the arguments fairly. And that is one of the bases on which you could challenge a decision um, but the problem was that this was all before the uh, Human Rights Act came into force. And in those days, um, the only way of enforcing your human rights was to go to the European Court in Strasbourg, which is what these gay service personnel did. And of course, they won if the Human Rights Act had taken effect uh, by the time that they uh, wanted to bring their action, then they could have taken action in the uh, courts of the United Kingdom. It took effect in 2000. So let's talk a little bit about the Gina Miller case. And my first question is that the 2015 Referendum Act contained nothing about what happens should a leave vote happen. Should all referendum acts, in your opinion, include an explanation of what happens in the event of either outcome? I don't think we should have any referendum acts. I don't think we should have any referendums. I think it's a very dangerous um, and unsatisfactory thing. Referendums have been used by governments to get them out of a hole. Referendums... Uh, the referendums on Europe were used, I, I say plural, because there was one in 1976, um, wasn't it? Um, five, which, yeah. Five, yeah, um, um, which, is, um, uh, uh, which I voted in. And um, um, it was, yes, that's right, it's 75. It's shortly after the UK joined the common market, as it then was. Uh, and the Labour Party was split. Um, and um, Harold Wilson called a referendum to endorse the UK's joining the common market um, in the hope of getting agreement, um, in the hope of, 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 of getting round the disagreement in his cabinet. And of course, you had the same thing um, for the 2016 referendum. And I don't think anybody really thought about what would happen if there was a yes vote. Um, and that's why there was nothing in the legislation. Now, it's in principle okay because you don't have to put things in legislation. You then, as a government, have to decide what to do, um, which is, of course, is, 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 is what the government then did. Um, it would have been more sensible, perhaps, to have uh, uh, had a, um, 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 uh, rather than a simple majority, you would have had a, a two-thirds majority, a 60-40 majority, a different majority, um, something like that. Um, there are all sorts of things you could have done, 
The fact is that the um, David Cameron took a gamble. He gambled on uh, getting the outcome he wanted. He lost, he resigned, and we're out. Um, and um, um, it, it certainly would have been better if all this had been explained. If there had been, um, if it had been explained, um, and there have been other referendum acts which do explain what should happen in the event of outcomes either way, then this whole question of the Gina Miller case wouldn't have been necessary. But as you say, it wasn't there. When the Gina Miller case, Enemies of the People headline came up, the Lord Chancellor, which is now a political role, didn't uh, immediately jump to the defence of the independence of the judges. But Brexit, uh, the Gina Miller case after so Brexit was about restoring parliamentary sovereignty as was their judgment. Well, Parliament can choose to invoke Article 50. So why didn't the judges defend themselves? This is a question I ask in the book, and I've, you know, I've been involved in conversations with um, the then Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas of Coombe Geath, um, who is the person who I blame for this. And he doesn't really have an answer, or if he does, he's not gonna give me one as a matter of principle. Judges don't usually talk about decisions once they've given them. But what I say in the book is that uh, if the judges had explained what happens next, then um, it would have been harder for the newspapers to have depicted this as the judges against the people. Now, what happened next was, as you remember, um, legislation. What happened to immediately afterwards was uh, Theresa May appealed to the Supreme Court and lost. But what happened after that was that she introduced legislation and she got it through Parliament with no trouble at all. Because in those days she had a comfortable majority for Brexit because MPs felt that they had to implement the result of the referendum. And if that meant passing legislation to allow her to give notice under Article 50 to trigger Brexit, well that's what MPs would support and they did. So um, there was no problem in getting the legislation through and everybody who really understood what was going on could see that as soon as the judgment was delivered. But maybe it would have helped if the judges had said, this is what can now happen. Now, why didn't they? Well, first of all, judges don't normally deal with what happens next. Secondly, they might think, well, it's not up to us to say what should happen. It might uh, be seen as interfering with Parliament. It might be seen to be giving a lead to Parliament. It might be seen to be taking sides as to what should happen. Uh, it might be a hint to Parliament that Parliament ought to do this. There are all sorts of reasons you can think of. But the fact is that nowhere in the judgment or in the press release that was issued did they explain what would happen next uh, and that, in fact, the government would have no trouble in triggering Brexit, as indeed it did. Um, you go on after the Gina Miller case to talk uh, to move on to criminal law, and in that chapter, I found one particular uh, thing very particular uh, interesting, and it's the John Warboys case. So people might remember him as the black cab racist. Now he was released on parole. Uh, the decision was challenged partly by victims, but also by the London mayor, um, and at the end of which. Um, uh, it was decided that victims of crime can challenge decisions to release a prisoner on parole if they believe it's fundamentally flawed. And my question to you is, isn't that victim's justice? Aren't victims always going to think parole release is flawed? I think that was a concern that the judges had in that case. And so what they did was that they contrived the grounds on which victims could seek judicial review of a decision to a very narrow area. They were worried about the floodgates, as it were. And the background to this is that um, uh, when parole was put onto a, a regularized, judicialized form, in other words, when you have a parole board, and I've been to a parole board hearing inside a prison, a parole board is a, a panel of three individuals and they decide whether it's safe to allow the prisoner to be let out uh, having completed the minimum part of his or her sentence. Um, and uh, what happened in the case of war boys, the black cab rapist, was that they uh, decided that it was safe for him to be let out and there was an outcry. Um, and uh, it's quite common for prisoners to seek judicial review of a parole board decision, in other words, to challenge a decision to refuse them parole, but nobody had ever done the opposite and nobody had ever uh, challenged a decision 
of the parole board to grant parole. And this was uh, lawyers for two victims who weren't named, who said that uh, the decision shouldn't have been taken. It was quite a difficult challenge because uh, we didn't have the reasons for the parole board's decision, although uh, they were in due course provided to the court and to lawyers for the complainants. And uh, the reason I put that case into the book, apart from the fact it's an interesting case, is an example of how the judges can develop the law, in this case judicial review, in order to achieve justice. There was absolutely no doubt that it was an injustice to let war boys out at that stage. Um, for various reasons, he'd not been charged with anything like the number of crimes and the panel of parole board members that looked at his case didn't have the sense or perhaps didn't have the initiative or didn't have the legal knowledge to work out a way of making sure that he served the right time for the number of offences he's actually committed and they simply judged him on the relatively small number of cases he was convicted of. So the courts were able to do justice but as it happens the floodgates have not opened. Um one of the fun things you do in the book is you introduce a case and then you ask the reader to stop and say what would you do and uh, one of those cases uh, we is called the gay cake case um, this is where a man walked into a, a cake shop ashes i think it was called and asked for a cake to be made with a message saying support gay marriage on it and ashes said that uh, they, because of their religious beliefs, so this is this clash between, say, gay rights and religion, which is one of the chapters in your book, uh, they were not willing to put that message on it. Um, the, uh, the person that got asked for the cake then challenged this, firstly through the Northern Ireland courts, who actually uh, ruled in favour, um, and then it ended up to, in the Supreme Court, and um, the Supreme Court pointed out it was the message that they objected to not the person delivering it to what, what i found interesting was how determined the courts in northern ireland were to insist it was in fact because lee who was the person who asked for the cake to be decorated was gay rather than because of the message um which is i guess an 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 in an explanation of why the Supreme Court was important because different courts can look at things differently and sometimes I guess make mistakes. Um, what can you say about this gay cake case in, in, in as, as I think you call it, that makes it so interesting? It is very interesting. I mean, um, some people in Northern Ireland um, would notice that the bakery had um, uh, named um, itself after um, Asher uh, one of uh, Jacob's 12 sons and uh, therefore there was a religious reference in the name of the bakery which I explain in a footnote uh, but um, Graham Lee didn't pick up that this was a Christian bakery uh, when he went in to have the cake made and the courts in Northern Ireland clearly felt that he had been the victim of discrimination uh, and they were very keen to uh, therefore find in his favour um, that wasn't uh, obviously what the Christian bakery uh, company uh, felt they said that they couldn't um, make him a cake which carried a slogan uh, which advocated uh, gay marriage which they didn't think was um, appropriate was not consistent with their religious beliefs but the interesting thing about the case when it got to the supreme court and i don't think i saw this coming i was very surprised i was at the supreme court for the judgment um, and and suddenly we we, we realized that the decision had been overturned I don't think anybody, I don't think even the, um, uh, the, the people from Ashers were expecting it. Um, the thinking behind it was that you don't have to be gay to support gay marriage. What Brenda Hale, what Lady Hale said in her judgment was that gay marriage is not just something welcomed by gay people, but she said by everybody because it creates stable societies, it ensures that people are uh, treated properly uh, and, and so on. And so um, it wasn't a question of, of uh, discriminating against him. Um, it was a question of uh, 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 their rights to say uh, that they won't make a cake um, uh, and they would say the same for everybody. And so from that reasoning, um, she was able to, um, she was able to, uh, to, to, to find in the way she did. I wonder if I can find the, uh, the, 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 the um, passage in um, the, uh, the, the book from 
uh, Lady Hale, because I think that um, it actually explains um, very well how, um, how, it, how it works. Um, my, uh, my index has failed, but I'm just going to go to the, um, the chapter um, on this and see if I can find it because I think it I think it explains it um, I think it explains it very well. Um, here we are. Right. Okay. Um, this is what Lady Hale said. As to Mr. Lee's claim based on sexual orientation discrimination, the Bakers did not refuse to fulfil his order because of his sexual orientation. They would have refused to make such a cake for any customer, irrespective of their sexual orientation. Their objection was to the message on the cake and not to the personal characteristics of Mr. Lee or anyone else he was associated with. The message on the cake would not just be for the benefit of gay people, but also for the benefit of their families and friends and anyone else who recognizes the social benefits which the commitment involved in gay marriage can bring. Accordingly, this court holds there was no discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation of Mr. Lee or anyone else he was associated with. Interesting, isn't it? Um Yes, um, you then move on in chapter eight to talk about privacy. And, and this is the classic clash between Article 10 and Article 8 of the ECHR, the right to privacy versus the right to free expression. You talk about the case of the publication of pictures of Naomi Campbell attempt, uh, uh, attending, I think, rehab, the search of Cliff Richard's house by BBC, the case of Prince Charles's black spider letters. There's a current case in the courts at the moment, that of Meghan Markle and the publication of letters to and from her dad. Who should win that case? I think that the uh, cases that you've just mentioned, which chart the developing law of privacy, much to the surprise of the media who haven't really understood the way it was going, I argue that the BBC didn't really grasp that it was invading Cliff Richard's privacy when it put a helicopter over uh, his flat when it was being searched by the police. Um, I, I think that if that trend carries on, um, then the Duchess of Sussex will win her claim against the publishers of the Mail on Sunday. Um, the, the interesting thing about this case is that although um, this publication was almost two years ago now, um, and uh, it hasn't got very far, although she issued proceedings pretty quickly, it's gone through the courts very slowly, and her latest set of lawyers had an idea, which was to ask for what's called summary judgment, the idea behind that is if it's absolutely clear which way the case is going to go uh, and you don't need oral evidence, you don't need witnesses to give evidence and be cross-examined, then you can argue that the court should find in your favour because there's no basis on which the defence could uh, um, prove anything at the trial uh, that would uh, change the outcome of the case, or it works the other way around, of course. Um, and the defence can say that uh, it couldn't possibly succeed. Um, but this is the claim that the Duchess is putting to um, Mr. Justice Warby. Uh, he heard the case last week, two days. He has reserved judgment. He'll be giving judgment uh, in a week or two. Um, and uh, uh, she is hoping um, that he will say um, that, yes, the newspaper invaded her privacy when it published a letter she wrote to her father. It will say there is no need for investigation of the circumstance in which the letter was drafted. She says she wrote it on her iPhone uh, app. Uh, the mail says that there was help from a palace press officer and therefore perhaps she doesn't have copyright in it. Um, it Mr. Justice Warby may, may well say that that doesn't make any difference uh, and there is no doubt that a, a letter to your father in these circumstances is private uh, and therefore it's an open and shut case and she may well win. There are so many examples uh, in your book of these cases. There's there's one about uh, whether a wheelchair space or baby or, or baby um, uh, pushchair push should yeah, be yeah. should okay. be allowed. There's there's one about um, the Charlie Guard case and the decision to to let him die. There's there's another one about civil partnerships for heterosexual couples and how long the judges waited for Parliament to uh, make a decision. But I suppose. My final question before I get to questions from um, our audience is, if parliamentary scrutiny was good enough, would we need judges? I think we would. I don't think that parliamentary scrutiny, um, I mean, parliamentary scrutiny is very poor at the moment. We've had vast amounts of legislation rush through uh, both over Brexit and over COVID uh, without the slightest opportunity for anybody to look at it sensibly. 
other legislation going through at the moment has been scrutinized. There are select committees, uh, committees looking at legislation in Parliament, and some of it's looked at quite carefully and changed as a result. But there's plenty of legislation that's not scrutinized. But even if, even if it were possible for Parliament to scrutinize legislation thoroughly, which it's not, as I say, you're never going to be able to have an act of Parliament which deals with all the exceptional circumstances. You're bound to have people saying, yes, but, you know, if it, I mean, for example, I'll give you one last example, and, and then and I know you've got questions coming. Lady Hale told me this story. Um, there's legislation, um, two bits of legislation, which were passed at roughly the same time before the First World War, and uh, it used the, first, the phrase, it referred to persons, people, persons. Um, and the question for the court was, well, what does persons mean? Um, and uh, before the war, before the First World War, it was quite clear, persons meant men. And after the war, it was quite clear, persons meant men and women. Same word, used by Parliament at the same time, different meaning. Um, and that's why you need Parliament. Uh, you can pass legislation, but the courts have to say what it means. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for your time speaking to me. And I'd like to start uh, with some questions. Um, and uh, the way questions are going to work is that I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask the question yourself, if, uh, if you can. Uh, and I'm going to start with a question from Claude Green, please. Claude Green. Yes, thanks. Uh, Joshua, um, with the, the current huge backlog in uh, court cases, um, I, I've come across quite a lot of discussion at the moment about potentially moving certain cases to be judge decided only and 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 put juries to one side what what do you think of of that of that proposal i think it's a bad idea i don't think a crisis is the right time to be making fundamental changes um this was um um came up um before the um justice Select committee um this afternoon um, there were a couple of witnesses, and and uh, and uh, uh, one of them, Dr. Hannah Quirk, um, um, said something to that effect. But I've said that myself. Um, I don't think that we should be doing away uh, with jury trial. Um, I agree that there are major problems. Um, if I can do something which is absolutely appalling, break an embargo, uh, the Labour Party is going to announce in all, all of. Um, um, three or four hours time uh, that it recommends that juries should be reduced to seven rather than 12 because it then would be easier to have seven jurors uh, socially isolated in a courtroom. I think in fact the courts have got around this um, already by putting plexiglass screens in courtrooms so I don't think it would make very much difference. I don't have a great problem with the idea of reducing jury numbers from 12 to seven uh, which happened during the second world war uh, but um, it was an idea that was put out because it was thought that it was going to be very difficult to get jurors. I don't think it has been difficult to get jurors, actually. Um, there have been all sorts of other problems. So, um, yes, um, you need initiatives to deal with this. Um, you know, here we're talking about England and Wales, but in Scotland, um, where they have juries of 15, um, they have decided to put jurors in multiplex cinemas and they watch the trial. The trial takes place in the courtroom and it's... Uh, uh, the watch of the case on the screen. This seems to be working perfectly well. Um, everybody in the courtroom can see the jurors um, on closed circuit TV. Everybody in the jury and they're spread around the, around the cinema seats can, can watch the proceedings. And as far as I know, it's working perfectly well. So I'm in favor of um, ways in which you get around it. Um, CCTV is used in England and Wales. You have maybe the jury um, and the uh, participants in one courtroom and you have the press uh, watching in another. You might, need, you might even have uh, um, a third court used for the jury retirement room so they're not sitting in a small room. So there are all sorts of ways around it. But as for deciding to reduce the availability of trial by jury, it's only available in a small number of cases at the moment. Um, and I really don't think now is the time to be changing it. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask, and, and everybody's more or less done this, but I forgot to say before I started the questions, if you can make them reasonably brief, it would be great. Uh, Joshua's promised to try and make his answers relatively brief as well and has allowed me to interrupt if he doesn't. Uh, the next question is from William Friendly, Flenley, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying William Friendly QC. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, you mentioned the committee looking at the scope of judicial review. I think it's chaired by Lord Folkes, who's quite keen on rowing back on judicial review and thinks the courts have gone too far. 
And what's your view about that? Do you think judicial review should be reduced in its scope? No, I don't. And I've been quite critical, not only of the fact that he is chairing the committee, a former uh, minister, a former conservative, he's no longer, uh, he no longer takes the conservative whip because he has a a job dealing with press complaints. Uh, but he was a Conservative minister and he did express his views publicly before he took this on. Also, I thought his terms of reference were rather tendentious, and I've said this publicly. And I think the government has learned from this because it's now set up another review of the Human Rights Act and it's got a retired judge, Sir Peter Gross, chairing that. And the terms of reference are entirely neutral. Uh, they're not questions that demand the answer yes. So um, I think it is a matter of some concern. But I think what can be said and what the Lord Chancellor says on uh, behalf of uh, Edward Folkes's committee is that it's not a committee of yes people. Um, Carol Harlow uh, from the London School of Economics is one of its members. Uh, she's certainly no pushover. Uh, and most of the people on that are uh, lawyers with no particular axe to grind. So I, I think the committee itself is neutral. Um, I think it's unfortunate that Edward Folkes was invited to chair it. Don't say he shouldn't have taken it on. Uh, but I think the government realises that it does look better to have somebody neutral chairing a committee like that. Um, the next question is from someone who's just put his initials. Luckily, I know who they are. It's JSG, the esteemed Mr. Gilbert, head of politics at Latimer. Uh, John Gilbert, what would you like to ask? Uh, hi, Joshua. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, yeah. Excellent. Um, you mentioned the redoubtable Lady Hale on several occasions in your, your talk. Um, of course, um, she retired a year ago from being president of the Supreme Court. To what extent do you feel her retirement has changed the tone or direction of the Supreme Court, or is it too early to say? I think it has changed the direction. Um, I think Lord Reed um, is a different uh, character. Um, I quote him in the book, um, and I say um, that he probably... He probably is less of an activist, although he says he's prepared to be activist in uh, areas of the technical areas of the law. Um, the interesting thing, of course, about Lady Hale, and in particular uh, in relation to my book, is that the book was being finalized um, in the autumn of 2019, a year and a half ago. Um, and in the draft, almost the final draft, it said, well, Lady Hale was expected to be activist in the two years that she was allowed to be president of the Supreme Court. Um, but in fact, uh, she was uh, not particularly activist at all. For example, she didn't uh, find a way of allowing no-fault divorce. Uh, she did say that was a matter to be left to Parliament. Um, and uh, then, of course, came, uh, came along Miller too, and there was this dramatic um, uh, decision, which she obviously engineered in the sense that she persuaded all the other members of the Supreme Court to agree uh, with her and Lord Reed, uh, the first and only um, time um, in, I think, uh, English legal history when 11 judges have agreed in this way. Um, and so, you know, it was in some ways seen as conventional judgment, in some ways seen as a very dramatic judgment. Um, and that, that's her contribution to, to legal history. Um, Lord Reed, as I say, uh, appears to be uh, a rather um, quieter, calmer, less excitable person, except in, unless you look at the, at the unison judgment. This is the judgment where he quoted Magna Carta. This is a judgment where he said that uh, the Lord Chancellor of the day, Chris Grayling, couldn't put up fees for employment tribunals uh, from nil to 1,600 pounds. Um, and, and that this was uh, something that just simply couldn't be done. It was a dramatic judgment, and one he clearly felt very strongly about, uh, and one that is seen as controversial, uh, but one where he decided that he wanted to be an activist judge, and one, I think, that uh, sealed his um, credentials as a worthy president of the Supreme Court. I agree with it entirely. So he is a different character, and, uh, um, you know, you now have two Scots uh, as president and deputy president, uh, but uh, Lord Hodges, his deputy. But um, on the whole, um, we haven't had any excitement since uh, the days of Miller too, but um, who knows, we shall see. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ron Pluskow is the next question. Good evening. Um, to what extent do you think the Supreme Court might be persuaded or tempted to follow the ECJ type of decision which affected UK when we were in the European Union? 
what extent would it follow e I did I missed slightly that did it what follow ECJ attempted to follow the type of decision that the ECJ used to give it had an effect on UK on the UK well the first thing to say is that we have retained EU law in the sense that um, you know, when we left the EU um, the law that was in force that was EU law became part of English law so to that extent they have to follow retained EU law they can overturn it but it's there um, that's that's the starting point otherwise you know we would have a great gap in the statute book um, I hope that they will um, I know that they will not behave in the same way that the EU court did, where you had these dreadful, where you have these dreadful um, committee decisions, um, where you know you can see there's been disagreement among the judges, but because they're not allowed to have dissenting judgments, uh, one person uh, it contributes one paragraph and somebody else who disagrees contributes the next, and they're in contradiction, and it's impossible to understand it. So we won't have that. Um, but um, it's really up to them to look at the law and decide what should be done, decide how to interpret it. It's really for Parliament to decide whether law needs to be changed, regulations need to be changed, directives need to be changed. I don't expect we're going to see the courts uh, overturning um, inherited EU law, uh, uh, but um, I think they may interpret it in a way that uh, uh, is at least easier to understand and perhaps more suitable for the UK. Uh, staying on the subject of the EU, I'm sorry I don't have your first name, it's D. Dean. D. Dean, with the next question. Hello, good evening, it's Damon Dean. I'm calling in from the Netherlands, good evening everybody. Hello. Um, so, uh, during the Vote Leave campaign, I, I was here in the Netherlands, but I saw a lot of the leaflets online, and I remember the Vote Leave campaign making a point of taking back control from the European Court of Justice and not wanting to be under the control of the European Court of Justice. But when um, the UK court paroled parliament and the UK Supreme Court ruled that unlawful, um, the UK uh, government at that time could not appeal to the European Court of Justice because the European Court of Justice has jurisdiction over matters that conflict with EU law. And I think the UK judiciary missed an opportunity there to clarify that the UK Supreme Court is and was the Supreme Court for constitutional criminal law matters, and that the uh, jurisdiction of the ECJ was not as broad and as wide and as deep as the Vote Leave campaign made out, and, and as many of the people who voted for Brexit believed. You're quite right to say that the European Court of Justice had no role in that case. Uh, it wasn't a question of EU law at all, um, and obviously the EU court was involved only in questions of EU law. Uh, so yes, it could well have made that political point, um, but I don't think it needed to because I don't think people thought of this as being an EU matter. This was about the UK's um, parliamentary procedures and uh, the power of the Prime Minister. Um, and this wasn't a matter that was uh, shared with the EU. So as you say, the EU court had no role. Um, uh, changing the subject slightly, um, and this is sort of about law, but also about balancing of rights. And I'm glad my daughter's had a friend once of the, the same name of this person, because I know the pronunciation. Neve. Question from Neve. Um, hi there. Yeah, my question was about um, how you see the balancing of the coronavirus restrictions and regulations and the right to education. So has this just become too hot a political topic and that's why we haven't seen it in front of the courts because there's clear inequalities and disparities around uh, not allowing the schools to open, particularly as the science seems to be highly disputed? I think you are right that this is seen as a political decision. This is above all a decision for government. Um, it's for the government to um, decide what the balance is. Um, in terms of the science, in terms of the schools, in terms of the economy and all the rest of it. There have been some challenges to the coronavirus re uh, legislation, regulations, which of course are extraordinary in their breadth, but they haven't got very far. Um, they haven't really got anywhere at the moment, and um, uh, nor have they been taken on quickly, which is something which the government um, must be quite pleased about. Um, contrast that with the uh, Brexit litigation, which was uh, taken through the courts very, very quickly um, because of the urgency of it and shows how quickly the courts can move if they choose to. 
Um, I think that the courts do think that this is political. Um, after all, um, how can the courts decide how to strike the balance? Now, you may say that the courts have to decide how to strike the balance between freedom of expression and privacy, which is what uh, you, Paul, were referring to earlier, Article 10 and Article 8 of the Human Rights Convention. Um, and that's something that they can do in an individual case. Um, they look at the two rights, the newspaper and the person whose privacy has been invaded, and decide uh, who has the, the stronger claim. But that's quite different from saying, you know, which is better for the schools to open and to increase the risk of infection, or for the schools to remain closed and for children's education to suffer. That is a political decision, and that's what we elect governments to uh, do. And if government gets it wrong, if governments get it wrong, then we elect another government. Thank you. Now, moving over to the United States with a question from Ben Miller. Um, do you think that it's at all likely or even possible that judges in the UK will become as visibly partisan um, as Supreme Court justices and indeed other federal and state justices have become um, in the United States? No, I don't. I think there is a great um, antipathy to that um, among the judges, among the lawyers who become judges, and even among the politicians, there is occasional talk of the equivalent of Senate confirmation hearings um, in the United Kingdom. Um, but nobody's in favour of this. Um, governments sort of toy with the idea. But I think, you know, the present Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland, who's a perfectly sensible chap, sees the disadvantage of politicising the judges. Um, as I say, it is said that if judges are going to take political decisions, then they're going to have to be uh, 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 have to be uh, appearing before politicians and explain what their views are. But that's not going to tell you anything very much about them anyway. Uh, they're just going to give neutral answers as judges do when they're questioned in the US. Um, and of course, we don't elect judges in the United Kingdom, um, and there is no call for that. I think people in the UK are very, very pleased that uh, the system has not developed as it has in the US. Um, and uh, I think that uh, they, or if they, it's not they, then certainly I, um, think that uh, you can take democracy too far in the sense of electing everybody from the judges to the dog catcher, uh, and that isn't necessary. Uh, it's perfectly possible to have good judges, even if you don't know what, what their views are. Uh, and if you don't know what their views are, the chances are their views are not ones you're going to object to. Um, next question is Soraya, Soraya Danani. Um, hi, I was, this might be quite a subjective view, but this is in the case of the cake. Um, general societal progress suggests that we'd want m as many people as possible to get to a position where they accept the LGBT community and community marriage, even if they're religious. So to what point should law then be used to try and enforce or push this societal progress at the, potentially at the expense of someone's free speech or their right to their own beliefs? That's a very good question. It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, the starting point is that at the time this case was brought in Northern Ireland, indeed at the time of the judgment, gay marriage was not lawful in Northern Ireland. It was in the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, and you may well say that Northern Ireland is different from the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, and therefore it should have different laws. After all, these things are devolved. There was no obligation on Northern Ireland to change its law in line with the rest of the United Kingdom. Or you may say it's very unfortunate for gay people in Northern Ireland who want to marry uh, and, and they can't do that because they're in Northern Ireland, or at least they can't marry in Northern Ireland. The law's now been changed um, and that's all gone through. I think that decisions like this are ultimately for the legislature, uh, for Parliament, for Stormont in Northern Ireland, although because of the fact that Stormont was not sitting in Northern Ireland and because of the fact that the political parties couldn't agree on what was necessary in order to restore Stormont uh, and because of the fact that the Westminster government got absolutely fed up with the delay in doing this, then the Westminster government gave the Northern Ireland government an ultimatum, unless you sort this out within a few months, this will go through. And it did, and it has. But ultimately, it is a matter for the legislature. Now, the courts can change opinion, the courts can test opinion, 
the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is a court uh, that sits in the same building as the UK Supreme Court, is hearing uh, two cases next month um, about gay marriage. Um, one uh, from the Cayman Islands, brought by two women who say that the constitution of the Cayman Islands should allow them to marry. The Cayman government says it does not and should not. Um, and the judges are going to have to interpret the constitution. They're not saying whether they support gay marriage or not. They probably do. But that's not the issue. The question is whether the constitution of the Cayman Islands does. And that's a question of interpreting it because when it was written, the concept of gay marriage didn't exist. So um, ultimately, these are matters for parliament. It's perfectly reasonable for people to campaign through the courts. If the law is clear, well, then the courts can declare it. But if the law is not clear or if there's any doubt of what the public think, I think then it is quite reasonable for the courts to say this is a matter for parliament. Um, and I think we're at almost at eight o'clock. Richard Ronald has a question. Richard Ronald. Richard? Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk, uh, Joshua. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah. What I was wondering was, well, are Euro other European countries more happy with the way that the legal system is operating because we, we whether is it our common law that is sort of stopping us from was <clears throat> stopping us from getting on so well with the ECJ and with the other legal systems in Europe? Well, you're quite right to say that the common law of the United Kingdom and of course Ireland um, is different, very different from the systems in continental Europe. Um, and from time to time, people in the UK say, let's have an inquisitorial system. Let's have investigating magistrates who uh, uh, look at cases and decide what should happen. The idea of treating a criminal prosecution like a game of cricket with one side bowling and the other batting um, is ridiculous. And the idea that you, know, you should have to um, uh, decide cases on the balance of probabilities and so on. Let's have somebody who can simply investigate both criminal and civil cases, if you like, and, and simply decide where the justice lies. Um, people in the United Kingdom don't really fancy that. Um, they think that the uh, system developed over the years has uh, worked very well. They don't like the idea of a code uh, that lays things down, which is very difficult to amend. They like the idea of the judges amending the law to deal with new concepts like cyber assets and things like that. The commercial court in London has a great advantage over commercial courts in continental Europe because it can uh, adapt so quickly. So um, I think people in the UK are on the whole pretty happy with the common law. Um, and uh, I'm not surprised that from time to time, uh, people in continental Europe look at it rather wistfully. And there's an awful lot wrong with the system, particularly at the moment. Um, but I don't think that uh, the UK is going to move closer to a continental system of law uh, anytime soon. Thank you very much, Joshua. I'm going to hand back to Joanna uh, Ingram. Thank you. Uh, that was lovely. Thank you, Joshua, uh, for sharing your years of knowledge and expertise with us all uh, this evening. It's been so interesting to hear how judges affect our lives in so many different ways. And if, like me, you're feeling inspired by Joshua's book and you want to read it cover to cover, we've added a link for you to copy out of the chat. And thank you, Paul, for being such a superb host this evening and to all our audience for your great questions and continued support of our online talks. I really can't emphasize this enough. Since we started this series back in the summer, we have raised over 16 and a half thousand pounds for our bursaries appeal and thank you. And if you haven't already and you would like to help us reach our next milestone, please do copy out the link of the, to the donations page. Um, and next week, we'll be joined by Latimerian and former editor of The Economist, Bill Emmett, and current head of Bloomberg Economics and Latimer parent, Stephanie Flanders, who will be discussing the post-pandemic world. If you'd like to find out more, head to our forthcoming um, events page. Again, the link is in the chat bar now and uh, to get yourself registered. You'll also find a link to our video library where you can catch up on our entire series of talks at your leisure. And sadly, that brings us to the end of this evening's talk. As always, thank you for joining us tonight.
Thanks again, Paul. And thank you so much, Joshua, for this inspiring hour. I hope we'll see you all again very soon. Good night.